the last part that we're going to have um, is associated with uh, what we talked about in terms of uh, understand. Uh, the part of this that says uh, we really need to make sure that we're guided uh, by our, our um, in, in, uh, good data, we, a robust analysis and research, uh, and that at the end of the day, we've done a very good job in connecting with uh, our policymakers and our public sector. And so I'd like to invite some people who are going to come to the stage and make a couple of comments on that before we uh, engage some thoughts for you. So in terms of uh, understanding how we try to understand the global entrepreneurial ecosystem, uh, first and foremost, I want to invite my colleague and fearless leader, uh, Phil Auerswald, who's the executive director of the Global Entrepreneurship Research Network. So welcome, Phil. And uh, one of our newest members of the Global Entrepreneurship Research Network that's doing really great future work as far as cities and, and understanding how we measure ecosystems and the future of cities, uh, Jamo um, Eskalin. Would you like to come to the table with Future Cities Catapult? Jamo. Um, and I'm just trying to see who else was going to be coming up. You notice that we deliberately didn't give you too much printed information because we want to be able to go on the flow here. But we've got Ellen uh, Olofsson from the World Bank. Ellen, I think she's here. Um, I'd also like to invite uh, J.F. Uh, Gauthier for, uh, to, to join us from um, um, uh, Startup Genome. And then I'd like to invite Kristen Schreiber, um, who runs uh, the directorate uh, to do with... Um, uh, DG Grow in, uh, in Brussels for the European uh, Commission. So, uh, Kristen, if you're here, if you can join us. Um, there you are. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, and then, um, uh, last but not least, oh, two more people. First of all, uh, Anders Hoffman, who I think is joining us um, from the Danish Business Authority. Anders, if you're here, you made it in from, uh, from Copenhagen. Awesome. And then we've also got um, uh, Zoltan Ox, who's going to join us uh, from Jedi. Zoltan is our uh, man behind the Global Entrepreneurship Index. Zoltan, are you here? I think I know he's been here all morning, but and I think Ainsley's here too. Ainsley, come up. Ainsley does all the hard work, so we'll have Ainsley come up and 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 participate. Wonderful. Okay, so um, there's one more chair here. Let me tell you who it's for. Um, it's someone that I hope once again needs. Oh, there he is. Good. Come on in. All right. I'll say there's one more white space that it's here for, because I'm uh, uh, going to be welcoming to the stage. Yes, careful of the edge. Um, uh, my, uh, my, my, my longtime colleague and one of the, uh, uh, really, the founding blocks of what we're doing in everything at the Global Entrepreneurship Network, uh, formerly with the Coffin Foundation, uh, now running everything we do in uh, research and policy. I'd like to do, welcome Christina Fernandez, who's our Vice President of Research and Policy, and she's going to guide us through a discussion of what are we doing in policy, what are we doing in research, and I think everyone would like to hear from you after we hear from our guests here. So, thank you. Christina. Oh, where is Doug? I'm missing one more person, and if I can please have another chair uh, for Mr. Doug Brandt, from, former Assistant Director for Entrepreneurship at the White House. Doug, are you there? Thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> well, the previous panel already mentioned government a lot of times, so it's good that I don't have to convince you that it's important for you to include uh, the government in your efforts uh, in your GW activities and in your inform in informing Gen country. So with us here today, I just wanted to show you a couple of ways that um, government can help you build a better ecos ecosystem. We have what it's called the Global Entrepreneurship Research Network. Uh, Phil is our executive director. And Phil, can you share please with us a couple of the projects we have and uh, uh, how those projects um, can help our leaders here uh, encourage ecosystem building at home or smarter interventions. Great, yeah, glad to do that. Um, actually, I want to find the person earlier who was talking about think tanks, about how we should create a think tank. Who was that? Is that back there? Yeah, were you talking about creating a think tank for, to, support, uh, uh, to, to support the work of uh, Gen Country hosts and uh, of entrepreneurs, is that right? Yeah, yeah, well, that's, that's great. I love that comment. 
uh, because that is really the spirit of what we're trying to do with the Global Entrepreneurship Research Network. Um, we have uh, universities uh, to do research. Uh, private citizens can do research. Uh, there's all kinds of venues for research to take place. Uh, the research that we want to be doing here is research that is in the service of a mission. And the mission of Jen is, at least as I see it, um, is that entrepreneurial in impact be as widely distributed as entrepreneurial potential. Um, how can research help to make that happen? Uh, well, we have all sorts of activities that are inspired by local contacts, they're inspired by people's creativity, that are inspired by networks of, of people who get together and brainstorm. Um, and those, those, those activities have some unique characteristics that are specific to the places in which you work. And, and we really want to honor and respect that uh, in the work that we're doing. But at the same time, there's commonalities. There's commonalities that are based on the fact that we're all human beings. There's commonalities in the fact that, that starting a business and growing a business has some common features regardless of the environment. Um, and there's commonalities in the ways that people interact within ecosystems and thinking about the different roles that, say, uh, government and large corporations and uh, universities and other actors uh, are involved with entrepreneurs. So uh, our work is essentially to try to draw upon those commonalities and to see how much we can learn from each other in, in doing this work. How do we do that? Um, well, uh, there are different scales of analysis that can be interesting. One is the individual. Um, and so I want to call out, I saw Anthony Farr is right there. Um, and um, later this week, uh, one of the really exciting things for us at the Global Entrepreneurship Research Network about being here uh, now in Johannesburg, uh, and then later in the week in, in Cape Town, is rolling out an initiative about entrepreneurial mindset. Um, and there was a reference also uh, earlier about the importance of mindset and how that can really frame uh, the, the, the attitudes and the approach, really the success of entrepreneurs. And this, this, this initiative has been led and driven by the Ellen Gray Orbis Foundation, uh, Anthony, uh, his uh, colleagues of Friedel Jacobs and Emmanuel Carmond have been at the center of that. Um, and we have been active uh, collaborators and attempted to facilitate that. But anyway, you'll be hearing more about that this week. And that's really focused on the individual level. Um, there's also the level of the firm. Um, and so the firm level, uh, we have work with uh, the Esmond uh, Network for Development Entrepreneurs and USAID, uh, Emory University, studying accelerators. And many of you in your country have accelerator programs. We urge you to, uh, so to, to sort of speak with us about that, that, that initiative that is about finding commonalities and how accelerators do their work and how effective they can be in supporting firms. And then importantly, again, for this meeting, because it's, it's such an important theme for the meeting and because we have people here to speak about it, cities, so uh, Yarmo um, uh, and, and JF have both been working at the city level, doing really, uh, I would say, a visionary work, uh, thinking about the role of entrepreneurships with it, with, within the broader context of growing cities. And then finally, at the national level. And, and Doug, uh, obviously, uh, has been leading uh, at the national level, and we have an you know, OECD uh, represented in, 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 in the uh, Global Entrepreneurship Index um, has been actually at regional level as well, but, but importantly at the national level. So we have uh, data at the national level. So uh, when you think about the work that we're doing, number one, it, it's only to be in service to the questions that you ask to us so that we can help you do this work more effectively. Questions that are not in service to you can take place elsewhere. They don't need to happen within the Global Entrepreneurship Research Network. And it's in those sort of broad categories. And then finally, um, I want to make sure that I call out Ellen Olson, who has been really a, a partner cutting across all of this because the World Bank uh, is, is interested in all of these areas of work. Um, and, um, and so and Ellen's group has been particularly focused on, on high growth entrepreneurship. And so Ellen will be, will be speaking about that. But anyway, I'll uh, now pass it along, I think first to you, Ellen. Uh, yeah, you're last to be introduced, first to speak. And so uh, I'd love to hear more about what you're doing. I'm going to step on. So, yes, yeah, as, uh, as Phil mentioned, we are conducting uh, research on basically from startup, startup to scale, um, trying to understand better what drives growth entrepreneurs as individuals or growth enterprises as companies. And then at the policy level, what are policy levers that can be used to enable that journey to happen? 
And so from the, from the very inception, uh, coming up with this idea of doing the research, uh, one of the early reference, reference points I was given was GERN, uh, the Global Entrepreneurship Research Network, and, and um, uh, reaching out to the community was, was a great resource to get started in terms of understanding who, you know, who else is interested in this, uh, in this area. Um, and it helped us sort of hone in on the key questions that, that we should look at. Um, we are uh, looking at starting with the firm level data. Uh, so we're working with, as you know, the World Bank works with primarily with governments as our, our clients. So we're working now with a set of 11 uh, countries that are providing access to their census uh, data which allows us to do some quite interesting uh, analysis in terms of growth of firms over time. Um, and we're also uh, partnering with the, um, the Startup Atlas um, effort of, of Gen in terms of understanding what policy efforts are ongoing. Um, maybe if, if I could put two, two big sort of asks out <laughs> to the audience, I think one is a big call for evaluation. Mm -hmm. So whatever you're doing, it's wonderful to hear about all of these efforts that are, that are happening. Um, uh, what we know very little about is outcomes, you know, what happens as a result, which is always hard to do uh, after the fact. Exactly. And so thinking about that early is, is sort of one, one call. Um, and another is around data for, for the government representatives that are here, thinking about what data to collect um, from companies that are starting and what data you collect throughout will help us to advance this agenda quite significantly. Thank you, Ellen. You've pointed out really well how research and policy should work together. That's why we have you all on the stage here. Um, the Startup, Nation, Startup, Na Startup Nation's Atlas of Policy, SNAP for short, is available for everyone who has uh, designed a policy or even has a policy idea to post information about it and, and then continue lo to log back into their um, contributor profile and upload uh, imp information on impact and valuation. So we're hoping that you all show to the world what, what policies you've tried. Even if they didn't work, that's still useful. Uh, we're all about knowledge sharing. So uh, if you haven't, if your country is not yet represented in the Atlas, I encourage you to contact me later and we'll um, make sure that that happens. Um, po since policy and research are joined together, I wanted to ask uh, Kristin Schreiber, who I know in her efforts in the, in the, through the European Commission is trying to connect the research that people like Anders Hoffman um, have developed and, in, in, and including that in the conversation among ministers. So I want to ask you, Christine, how, how are you, why are these ministerial still important and how are you making sure they're connected to the research that will guide them towards smarter programs and policies? I think I'll stand because sure. otherwise I might fall off this thing. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much, Christina. I think ministerials on the issue that's amazing matter a lot. And the reason is simply that, I mean, many, many, much, much policy making is actually geared directly or indirectly to SMEs and entrepreneurship. But very often SMEs don't have a dedicated ministry. And even if they do, that ministry has to often fight for attention mm -hmm. and fight for getting these issues through uh, with regard to other policy priorities. And I think this is, that, that, therefore, it's so crucial that basically, on the one hand, one shares experience and sees how one uh, has gained experience in putting the SME agenda at the very forefront, I would say, of the national agenda. Mm -hmm. And then second, also, of course, uh, we're talking about ecosystems, very much local issues, but we need to connect the different ecosystems. I would say we have some experience in the European Union. I'm very happy that Anders is there. He's actually a very prominent member of our SME Envoy network where we try to do just that. We have basically an SME envoy per member state um, whose role is to uh, share, I mean, to, uh, to share experience on SME policy at national level to bring, I would say, European issues to the attention of their respective governments. 
And I think at the global level, and we saw this already last time in Medellin, I think it's also crucial to discuss the issue how SME policy, entrepreneurship policies can contribute to the wider issues of uh, democracy, stability, and there I think we also have interesting stories to share. Certainly, I was um, very privileged to be at the uh, SME Assembly in Bratislava last November. And even though it's called an SME Assembly, they were talking about not just startup policy, but also scale-up policy. And for that, I wanted Anders to comment a little bit about what the next frontier is in terms of these SME Assemblies, SME Ministerials, which we would uh, like to call Startup Nations Ministerials in the future. Well, thank you. No, I think it's, it's, it's really good that we have sort of added the scale-up agenda to, to this, this whole event. Uh, I think for many years we've simply been struggling in just trying to get firms to start and, and making that possible. And a lot of places we have managed to solve that. Now I think we see more and more places where we actually have people starting up the companies, but now they don't grow it. So I mean, I think you need to have this both, the focus on both sides, both the sort of starting up, and it's, that's a bit more fun. Because a lot of the companies that keep growing are actually slightly more old and slightly boring. So it's, it's even harder to get that agenda going politically. Because it's, I mean, it's relatively easy to get politicians to in, be interested in young, sexy startup companies, especially if there's kid around who are doing fun stuff. Then, then you can get them to come. But some of these slightly older, in all the sectors that are starting to grow, that, to get their tenure of policymakers for those types of companies, that's really hard. So I think it's extremely important that those are included in ministerials because ministers, they actually set agendas, so they, they should know that this is the agenda they need to set and they need to work on. Thank you, Anders. Um, and with regards to the whole semantics issue of whether it's, a, it's a SME policy, it's entrepreneurship policy, is it scale-up policy, should all those be discussed together? I wanted to, um, Doug Rand, who worked um, in the White House with President Obama, and managed to differentiate entrepreneurship policy from the um, more broader SME policy. Can you share a little bit more about your experience and what you, br you brought from the private sector into government in that regard and what you hope your legacy um, is? <laughs> Thanks, Christina. It's really humbling to be here with everybody today uh, and really exciting to be here in, in Johannesburg uh, with so many people from all over the world uh, with a shared mission. Uh, <clears throat> I, I came into President Obama's White House in 2010 as an as a entrepreneur in my prior life. And uh, it was a really special moment where the president and his advisors really wanted the answer to a fundamental question that everyone in this room really cares about, uh, which is everybody knows that uh, small businesses are the bedrock of the national economy, that's true in every country. The small businesses are everywhere, they're in every village, they're in every uh, uh, town center. The United States has 27 million small businesses and the federal, state, and local governments do a ton uh, to try to help uh, those small businesses grow and succeed. What the latest data from the Coffin Foundation at the time was showing was that uh, there's a small subset of those uh, small and young companies, maybe a couple hundred thousand, that ultimately over time end up getting quite big. They, uh, and they have a disproportionate effect on job creation, they have a disproportionate effect on innovation. Uh, and what do we know about these, these companies, uh, these high growth potential companies? We know they're not just in technology, they're in all kinds of industries, as a number of people have noted today. Uh, we know that they're not just in Silicon Valley or just in the technology hubs, they're all over the country. Uh, and the other thing we know about these companies is that nobody knows who they are ahead of time. Not even professional investors, not even venture capitalists have anything close to 100% track record in terms of predicting who are uh, the, uh, the tiny companies that are ultimately going to get big. Um, and so what would a new uh, set of policies look like and a new set of engagements with the private sector to really enable a diverse set of, uh, of startups to grow and ultimately scale across the country and communities all across the country. So that was the genesis of what became our Startup America initiative. And I just want to tell one very quick story because I know we're all standing between everyone out there and lunch, which is not a great place to be, uh, is that um, one of the first things we, tr we tr started to work on was uh, what ultimately became something called the the Jobs Act, the Jumpstart Our Business Startups Act, which was a bipartisan bill that President Obama signed in 2012. It had elements of uh, um, helping really young startups in terms of uh, equity-based crowdfunding. It had elements to help with scale-ups, to help, uh, help companies access public markets a little more efficiently. But one thing that, that I certainly never anticipated is that at the same time we were working on trying to get this done in the United States, lots of other countries uh, were watching uh, and were getting it done, in many cases, faster than us. 
So in the time it took us to get something through Congress and get something through our regulator and so on and so forth, um, it wasn't until uh, middle of last year that the rules were all set and the first generation of, uh, of crowdfunding platforms uh, went to market. Dozens of countries had already passed their own crowdfunding laws. So I didn't even realize I was part of a community of entrepreneur-focused policymakers uh, uh, until a couple years down the road. And so I think it's been really exciting to be part of that community and to see how uh, Global Entrepreneurship Network and Startup Nations bring that community together so we can all learn from each other. The best ideas do not exclusively come from the United States by any stretch. So it's been really, uh, really wonderful to learn from uh, other policymakers uh, all around the world. Thank you, Doug. As he mentioned, Startup America started inspiring other movements, um, including Startup Canada, Startup Britain, Startup Lithuania, and we're happy to have them among our members. Uh, some of them uh, focus strictly on policy, but others were, al were also initiatives uh, that have activities at the grassroots level. For Startup Nations, we do try to focus the conversation on policy and exchanging that knowledge. And also, we started via that atlas that I mentioned um, to document what, what experimentations have been going on around the world. Doug, you're right now not part of the White House anymore, but we certainly encourage you to put all that you've done into the atlas so that when somebody, another country that doesn't have crowdfunding legislation and other things that you've done at the White House with your team there, um, they don't have to reinvent the wheel from, and, and uh, Startup Nation, the, the atlas has a good cool feature, which is uh, it allows you to contact the contributor so uh, it won't give you Doug's email, but you will, through Gen Connect, which Jonathan mentioned, and you'll get a t-shirt if you sign up. Um, through Gen Connect, you can reach to Doug and ask for more information because among our network, uh, we seem to already understand what the policy priorities are, but the challenges are always on the implementation side. Um, and, that, and that knowledge is key to move the frontier forward and um, allow countries to catch up faster in terms of um, um, this, uh, disruptive or innovative uh, policies. Um, we also heard that you've done some things for cities around the U.S. It's not all about national policies, it's cities. And for that reason, I wanted to bring um, JF and Jarmo, who've done a lot of work in, in this realm. And Jarmo, can you tell us a little bit about how your work uh, is inspiring smarter uh, digital cities? Well, uh, hello, Jarmo from Future Cities Catapult. Uh, we are a UK uh, urban innovation center and uh, working on urban innovation to grow companies and make cities better, whatever that means. Uh, I think the, uh, the reason uh, we are part of this domain is the sort of two fundamental forces which are changing our cities. First of all, and the biggest one of these is just the fact that urbanization is the fundamental change factor in the, in the world at the moment. Hundreds of millions of people are going to move to cities in the coming decades. And where there's growth, there's opportunity. Of course, there's unbelievable challenges as well, but there's also opportunity. And the other factor is the factor of digitalization in cities. Biggest urban innovations lately uh, haven't come from urban developers. They come from platform companies who launch services on, on our global cities and change the landscape very fast, change the urban services and business landscape quite rapidly when they get to that scale, with that magnitude. Uh, Uber at the moment is probably one of the safest ways to travel in Johannesburg, uh, and people are using it, it all, over, all over global cities. Um, and both of these things come with a set of challenges for cities, and which is something we will need to collaborate on, because Cities are used to do things alone, but not no one city is a market, no matter how big it is. In the digital domain, it's not a market. A market is when you have 10, 20, 50, 100, 1,000 cities, then you have a market. And our cities are quite badly equipped to build, join forces to build this market. And they should be there. It shouldn't be just the companies which build the platforms, but the cities which are enablers for innovation. And uh, we've recognized that there's a market failure, which basically consists of technological challenges, cities are inter interoperable technologically, but then even more so of competent challenges. Cities are not equipped to really work with high, fast-paced innovators or join forces with others. Tim Campbell's 
great book Beyond Smart Cities recognizes that the cities, all city strategies are the same, but the ones who actually make it are the ones who live the change. Who sort of personally, who people who link to other people from other cities and build these networks. And that's the reason we are here. So uh, in future is catapult, we want to fix these market failures, to work on city strategies, to connect the cities, to work on open, open, uh, open data. But we need the cities to be our partners because we are not a city ourselves. Uh, and we need those platforms where cities and entrepreneurs come together. And GEN is, of course, pretty substantially one of those. And particularly here, what we are aiming for to get research which enables us to fix these market failures, to join forces with others to fix them. Uh, we want to work on assessing the impact of different uh, activities, different uh, uh, investments on inno innovation, so that when we evaluate the sustainability of cities from environmental, economical, and sustainable, uh, the uh, social viewpoints, entrepreneurship would be there strongly as one thing we can measure and compare between our, our global cities. And the tools for that are currently mostly lacking. Mm -hmm. Cities measure that very differently. It's hard to compare how entrepreneurship friendly our cities are. And that's something we aim for from our collaboration. So open innovation with other partners here. Uh, great cities to work with. We are very international in our activities. We're currently working in Pune, India, in Belo Horizonte, Brazil, in Santander, Spain, in Belfast, Northern Ireland, to name a few. Thank you, Jarmo. You've touched on two very important points, which is data. GERN tries to facilitate making that data from our communities around 171 countries available to researchers. And the second point was a common methodology. We want to be able to compare uh, results across countries. The World Bank has done uh, great work through their network to do this. But through GEN and GERN specifically, we hope to expand the number of countries that participate uh, in any single study. Before we move, off, move on from the topic of cities, I wanted JF to share a little bit about his um, approach on the life cycle model for city leaders who are trying to see where exactly they need to invest uh, or, or where, where the policies will be most necessary at that stage, at any stage in time. So, JF, thank you for being here and joining and Thank you, Christina. So I'm JF Gauthier, we're a startup genome, and we are a global startup community effort to quantify and standardize knowledge on our ecosystems to bring it to city leaders and country leaders. So when you talk about action, it's about doing the right action at the right time. Right? We all have too little resource to do everything all the time. And it's about learning from each other. Right? So we studied 56 cities in 28 countries through the voice of entrepreneurs. More than 10,000 startups participated in our research. And so it's really about the, what the early stage startups are living in terms of accessing knowledge, resources, talent. And by the way, tonight with the Global Entrepreneurship Network, we are publishing the new global report, the new global ranking, and the life cycle model that we really improved and now allows us to know what to do at the right time. So we study those 56 cities to understand how do cities, city ecosystems evolve over time. Secondly, what are the top actions that they can take at each phase of their development? And thirdly, what are the strengths and weaknesses of your ecosystem? Because, and then, you know, measurements is not about measurements, it's about taking action. If you don't take action, then you're wasting your time. And it's about taking the right action at the right time, which means identifying policies that actually work. So we spend a lot of time then quantifying the impact of those policies, gathering them from all our members, 56 cities, and growing. By the way, we're going to start studying more cities next month. So if you're interested, talk to me. Uh, so that. We identify the best policies that have actually worked in practice, and you can learn from that and implement them after that. Thank you, JF. Thank you. Um, you've touched on an important question that's in most of our uh, GEN delegates' mind, which is, if I don't yet have 
uh, my government involved in having sent a member from my country to our Startup Nation Summit, which is annually, uh, where do I get started? And so we've partnered with the Get I Institute to make sure that there's an approach that can be understood not just in terms of a ranking, but in terms of um, understanding where the bottlenecks are. So Sultan, do you want to tell us about uh, uh, how you work with governments to make that data useful in, in creating a, a national entrepreneurship strategy or, or a plan for action? Thank you. If you take 10, and Anders has probably done this, if you take 10 government people and put them into the room, from different organizations like education, health, finance, whatever, right? And then you asked all of them, what should we do to improve entrepreneurship, startups, and growth? They'd all give you different answers, right? And each one would say, I need more money for R&D, or I need more money for education, or I need more money for data, right? So what the GEI index does is it takes the whole world, all different countries, and compares them all on the same set of data, 31 variables, individual and institutions. And when those government people sit down in the room, Ellen from the World Bank would say, oh, we need more of this. Then we'd look at the data and say, oh, you have the most of that. You don't need anything, right? And then we get to the next person, Anders, and he would say, I think we need more of this. And we look at this and say, yeah, you don't have enough of that. Right? And then you can have a dialogue where you all start from the same basic statistics. Right? And then you can debate exactly what to do, but you're really all on the same page. Yes. So Ainsley, why don't you say a little bit about... Yeah, because Ainsley, you've probably been in contact with her if you were interested in the, in the index. I've always put you in touch with Ainsley because she would help you digest the analysis from a non-academic perspective and making sure you can use the data to, during your global entrepreneurship weeks, week activities or beyond, to engage your government and policymakers. So Ainsley, can you share a little bit about that experience that you've had with Gen Country leaders? Sure. Thank you, Christina. Um, so at the Jedi Institute, we're interested not just in producing research, but also with engaging with people on that research and trying to further policy um, on entrepreneurship. So um, working with some of the countries that we've worked with, um, we do something that we call policy facilitation, and Zoltan touched on that a little bit, where we gather a group of entrepreneurs and policymakers in the same room, develop a shared understanding of the data landscape around entrepreneurship, so everyone is coming from the same point, and then we develop a strategy um, for addressing the ecosystem bottlenecks uh, that is based on that shared understanding where both the entrepreneurial uh, influencers and the policymakers are engaging in mutually supportive activities to try and develop the uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem. And so our support for countries when we engage with them can range from a very sophisticated policy facilitation um, type activity to some very simple things like these cool business cards that I have. I have one for every country and there's an infographic that gives you a basic snapshot of where the country stands on entrepreneurship. So we're interested in putting out a variety of things um, that help people understand where their country is and what they can do to help it. We're also doing something else new, which we're really excited about. Um, how many of you like science? Yeah, science is great, right? We like science too. Um, so the new thing that we're working on is we are developing a laboratory, not a physical laboratory, but a virtual laboratory in which we can observe entrepreneurship activity at the micro level and track that progress alongside indicators of the macro level of the policy environment to try and better understand the linkages between the innovative process and the policy levers designed to influence that. So that's our exciting new initiative. Uh, come chat with us if you want to know more. Yes, they'll have a session as well. Um, go ahead. So, so I'd like to say one more thing. If I, if I ask myself the question, what is the most interesting thing happening in entrepreneurship in the world? Right? I mean, we have all sorts of different aspects. And what I lose sleep over, because I can't quite figure it out, is how can we explain how a 22-year-old creates a $22 billion company? Right? I mean, whether it's Uber or Snap or whatever. But how does this happen? 
right? It's the one in the million event, but it's that event that changes the world. It's not all, all the little events. Those are all nice, but that's the event, right? And just think of Uber, right? Here is a company created by a 22-year-old that is now a global transportation company that employs 11,000 employees and hundreds of thousands of digital entrepreneurs, right? And we just came from Cape Town and we talked to about 30 Uber drivers. Uber has made the lives of every one of them better. I mean, it's unbelievable, right? And there were dozens, if not hundreds, of these companies that are using digital technologies, creating platforms, employing millions and millions of digital entrepreneurs, and making the world a better place. And we don't really know how a 22-year-old creates a $22 billion company. We just don't know. And I think part of the reason we don't know that is because this whole digital disruption world um, has caused confusion in the government about labor laws. Right. So how do we adapt new regulations, new regulatory frameworks to these new models that we have in the economy, what it means to be a worker, what it means to have social security these days. Um, and we hope that, our, that in the ministerial that would occur tomorrow, uh, our ministers will get to tackle some of those difficult issues Jarmo, I know you are, you've worked a lot in the digital space as well. That's your focus. And then, um, you want to add anything? I don't think we should go in the uh, discussion about whether Uber is uh, only a blessing, because that might be a long one. Uh, so, uh, but it's certainly true that platform, we haven't seen the end of, we only see the start of platform companies or platform-based business models, and the reason for that is that there are so many things which can be turned into a platform. Healthcare will be the one, for example. Healthcare will be there. It's just more complex, so it hasn't happened yet, but it will happen. So just waiting for that. Uh, while I have the mic, I fix a thing I didn't do in my previous address, which is completely unrelated, but I, somebody told me that this is, this is a Gen family. And since I'm a new family member, I decided to make us stronger by bringing an older family member with me, not in age, but in experience. And uh, so I want to point out Darren Balcom from there, <laughs> who there. some of you might know from future this catapult, who's been in Gen quite a few times before. Mm -hmm. So you can reach out to him. He's a, he's a better networker than I am. Yes, Anders. And this is just, just to, to follow up on, on some of Solson's point. I think just for everybody, if you want to do something really simple, uh, go back home, find some of the countries you normally compare it to, find the two or three variables where you're very different from them, and start the policy discussion from that. It always works. And I'm sure they would help you find it. And it, we have done it in, I've seen many, many countries that do this. And it's so easy because you say, I mean, no, we can't be that bad compared to Sweden as Danes. I mean, that would be the worst in Denmark. I'm sure every country has something like that. So try and do that in the extremely simple, and it's very, very good for the policy debate, because then you get some action. Thank you. I think, Phil. Yeah. Just well, just on <clears throat> people who weren't mentioned, I also uh, was remiss in not noting uh, the Korea Entrepreneurship Foundation that hosted us in Daegu for GEC+. Plus. Yeah, and that's where this work on uh, mindset really got some momentum. So Moon Sun, who's here in Jaehyung Park, and others from KEF, I want to make sure that they're acknowledged for hosting a beautiful meeting there in Daegu uh, last summer. So go ahead, Zoltan. Just, just one quick note. Um, if you would like to just look at like your country, your data, we have a tool on the JEDI website. You just go to it, click on it. And you could put your country in other countries, and you just make these little comparisons. It'll give you in two seconds very interesting data on just sort of where you are. Thank you. Thank you, Sultan. I want to ask um, one last question to uh, Doug. Among our, our Startup Nation members in, um, we met last time in Ireland in November. The big question is how do you convince politicians to invest in, in a program or, or a policy tool, policy lever for entrepreneurs that would only have results uh, in the long term? Do you perhaps have any insight on that? Um, 
that you can share with our members present here? Sure. Uh, well, I'm interested in hearing uh, later in this conference from people who are coming up with that challenge. I mean, I think that you said it best. I mean, it's actually pushing on an open door, I think, if you pitch it in the right way, right? Because yes, it may take many years for a given startup to achieve scale, but in the near term, startups are only creating jobs. They're, they're not destroying jobs, right? And so there's plenty of photo ops uh, for uh, you know, ministers and other politicians to be surrounded by eager, uh, 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 exciting entrepreneurs who are uh, doing important, innovative things for the country uh, and, and creating jobs uh, and uh, hopefully creating more, a more inclusive workforce. Um, so I'd be happy to talk to anybody who's, who's having difficulties, but I think that we all benefit from really uh, uh, being in a space that's pretty bipartisan uh, and, and, uh, and fairly easy to uh, move forward compared to lots of other policy priorities. Thank you. I know we have some new uh, members of Startup Nations. We have a policy advisor from Ghana, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Richard, can you introduce yourself and perhaps you have any thoughts as to what you hope to learn from our Startup Nations members going forward? Or what you wish what? to share about Ghana in the, policies, in the entrepreneurship policy space? Okay, thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Richard, and uh, for the first time in Ghana's history, we now have a Ministry for Business Development. Uh, so, in the past, entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship or entrepreneurial activities have been focused on the Ministry of Trade. Uh, but now there's a specific focus. There's some funding that has been allocated, and we're looking at building entrepreneurship from the ground up. So start from junior high school, senior high school, into the universities, incubators, accelerators, and so on. So build it from ground up. The whole idea is to build entrepreneurial mindsets in school kids, so that by the time they get to university, there's some sort of uh, thinking. Currently, let me give you some numbers. We've got about 250,000 unemployed graduates. That is uh, simmering. Uh, some people call it a national security issue. Having young people idling about, not engaged. That is just from the university type kind of environment. We haven't talked about the technical or the vocational sort of institute. So, for the first time, we are looking at putting together a national entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship and innovation plan and a policy. I'm, I'm interested to talk to people here about that. Uh, the government has committed some money towards this initiative. Uh, we're looking at starting incubators across the country and accelerators as well. And then finally, the SME uh, network, advisory network. Ideally, you should be able to walk into uh, an enterprise agency for some sort of advice with your business plan, strategy, fundraising, and so on and so forth. So th these are all, all the different things that we are thinking about over the next three, four years. My challenge is to leverage some funding from the government with private sector participation to raise some significant, significant funding to, to make sure this program is rolled out. So these are our initial thoughts. Uh, from Ghana. Actually, we've been involved in the GEN network since 2008. My colleague here, uh, Stephen, has been doing some fantastic work. We've supported so many startups. I think one of our startups was the first uh, African startup to get to Startup 500, Dropify. Uh, we also have Farmer Line, which has developed a product to support about 200,000 farmers. So, Yes, there are things bubbling and sort of, but it's about pulling it all together and getting some sort of coherent strategy going forward. Thank you very much. Yeah, actually, I wanted to respond to that in two, two dimensions. One is uh, baseline and the other is demographics. Uh, on baselines, um, I mean, I think a lot of times people will say, well, we're not ready to do research. You know, we really have to get our programs together. Um, reasonable from a resource standpoint, but from a research standpoint, it's, it's, it's essential to get as much data as you can before you begin because it's those data that will allow you to determine whether or to what extent what you've been doing has been successful. So, so, so that's, for example, the Alan Gray Orbis uh, initiative on mindset. This is gonna be enormously valuable. The, er, the, the earlier you are in the process of building your ecosystem, really the more valuable it will be down the road in terms of understanding what the impact, what you've done. Broadly speaking for this community, I think we should, we're sort of you know, focused a year to five years out 
out. We have to be action-oriented. But I think that we should appreciate that this entire world of global entrepreneurship transformation and digital transformation is only at the very beginning. Uh, in Estonia, they've now got the uh, process of business creation down to six minutes. Uh, but with smart contracts and the blockchain and so forth and so on, maybe it'll be uh, six milliseconds that you could form and dissolve a company and people will have reputation-based companies that are being uh, created and dissolved on an ongoing basis. I mean, this seems kind of absurd now, but the way in which we do business now would have seemed absurd uh, you know, 100 years ago, 50 years ago, 20 years ago. So when we look 30 years out, the magnitude of the transformations that we may be seeing are enormous. And second point, demographics, right? We have to actually, I mean, it's a, you know, it's a privilege and I think a wonderful opportunity for all of us to be here in Johannesburg, to be here in South Africa, and to be here on the African continent, because the African continent is distinct really now at this point from the rest of the planet. All of East Asia, all of Europe, and all of North America are at below replacement rate fertility, which means all of East Asia, all of Europe, and all of North America would be in population decline were it not for immigration and for population aging. Why do I say that? Because the entrepreneurship challenges in all of those continents that I just mentioned are completely different from on the African continent. At the African continent is the growth continent for the human race in the next in, in the next 50 years. And so the challenge of making the most of young talent uh, on the African continent and making sure that it's a resource globally for growth and innovation everywhere. It's not, it's not a South Africa challenge. It's not an African continent challenge. It's a challenge for all of humanity. We absolutely have to make sure that the resources are here so everybody on this continent flourishes because that's where population is growing. That's where our, 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 the, the, the humanity is growing. So, so this is enormously important. It's enormously important to this movement. And I think it has relevance to what we do in the research community. Yes, thank you, Phil. And I just wanted to add that, that atlas of policies we have also, thanks to the help from the World Bank that we got in, in building the questionnaire that will ask you, uh, what are your goals? What are the expected outcomes? What's your timeline? If you're just starting with a policy, don't be afraid. Still um, contribute to SNAP because that would allow you to think through the process of um, um, designing and then implementing that uh, new policy instrument or institution even. Uh, we have to close because I know everyone's hungry, but I just wanted to make sure you knew that our GERM members will be around all week. Uh, there will be a sessions on accelerators uh, run by Dave Moskowitz in, in, in collaboration with our, the Global Accelerator Learning Initiative. We've done, we have some results, results on that front and hope you will learn if you're interested in, in, uh, in that uh, space. We also have another session on city ecosystems. The World Bank will be featuring, will be sharing their new, newest results for the continent and globally as well. Uh, so check out the program. Always check the online program uh, because it might, might have been a slight room adjustment or time adjustment. And with that, uh, thank you everyone and uh, don't be afraid to talk about research and policy. We're very open. Thank you. <laughs> Stay here. Uh, Christina, stay up here. I just want to uh, say a really big thanks to you because um, uh, Christina and Phil uh, have done uh, yeoman's work in searching the world to find out who's on the leading edge of what's happening in the entrepreneurship research space, but also, I think, particularly in the policy space where uh, um, finding people like Doug, in fact, Doug, I wanted to tell you, um, you know, we used to actually refer to startup nations before... Uh, Doug didn't realize this, but we called it the Doug Rand Network, because basically when we were trying to define who we wanted, he was our role model. We wanted to find in every country who was our Doug Rand, and he said, you can't do that, but now you're out of the White House, we can probably say anything. So we'll still call ourselves the Doug Rand Network. So I really want to tell you, your, your personal legacy in establishing a body of work among policymakers to understand how we advance the starting and scaling of firms with public policies uh, will be uh, remarked in history. And I want to just say that publicly. I had the great pleasure here in Africa uh, to uh, sit with President Obama for a few minutes. And he said to me, can you tell me something I don't know, Jonathan? And I said, well, Mr. President, I don't know whether you know this, but I just want to tell you one thing. The fact that you set an example as a head of state in understanding the distinction between policies to advance new firm formation as opposed to just SME policy, set an example around the world. We have 57 countries that now have policymakers part of our startup nations community. And uh, I want to say a special thanks to you, Doug, because it really is, is, is really been your legacy. Please.